Hello and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. This is the show where we talk about what is happening right now. We're gonna get some questions in and we've got some experts here who are going to answer it well, whatever the question is. So let's look forward to that. I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the crop sciences department. So my areas are cut flowers as well as perennials in the landscape. However, we have three highly intelligent people. I'm looking at them and I know that they're the three really highly intelligent folks that are meant to be on the show for today. So let's find out who they are and they're each gonna answer a, either a show, it, show a show and tell or answer an email. All right, let's start first with you, Dr. Tom Voigt. Uh, thanks, Diane. Hi, I'm Tom Voigt. I work, also work in the Department of Crop Sciences and I work with perennial grasses. So lawn grasses, ornamental grasses, prairie grasses, bioenergy grasses. And uh, my uh, show and tell, uh, first show and tell this evening, is, uh, is white clover. And, and uh, one of the things that you'll notice uh, as, you, as I drive through the, the uh, viewing area is lots of white clover, lots oh, yeah. of patches of white clover. Well, white clover is a perennial and it's a legume. And it's, it's a, gra uh, it's a um, broadleaf weed that, that does particularly well when we have uh, cool and wet conditions. And, and obviously we've had a good amount of rainfall recently. So it's, it's really done well. It does do well in low nitrogen uh, situations. And so uh, um, even in uh, lawns that may have been fertilized a little bit, we'll find that, that with all this rainfall that the turf is using a lot of nitrogen. Plus we're seeing a lot of nitrogen leaching out of the, out of mm -hmm. the, uh, um, out of the root zone. And so those areas may be deficient in nitrogen even though they've had a little nitrogen and certainly we see it in a lot of low nitrogen uh, settings as well. It's interesting to note that white clover was a component of, of most lawn uh, mixes uh, up until the time we had chemicals that would kill it and control it. So during uh, World War II and right afterwards, these, a lot of these chemicals, uh, lawn care, or they were developed for the war efforts, uh, became uh, used in lawn and turf. And so white clover went from being a desirable component in the lawn uh, to an undesirable component. It's a, a nitrogen fixer, so it, was, it worked particularly well to help fertilize the turf, uh, uh, provide some nitrogen for the turf around it. If you see pig patches of white clover, you often see that the turf growing around that patch will be dark green and and taller than the turf a little bit away from uh, that patch. So so at any rate, right now we have a lot of white clover. You can leave white clover in your lawn and, 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 and think about it as a, more of an organic situation. Or if you'd like to control white clover, one of the things you'll find that is that 2,4-D doesn't work all that well on controlling white clover. And so we there are other, some other products such as Mecaprop uh, or Clopyrrolid as post-emergence chemicals that, that can uh, provide, you, uh, provide some control. Be sure to read and understand and follow all the label instructions uh, mm -hmm. as you're applying this. Um, so, and here's, well, we saw the, we saw the sample of white clover. So, so that, that's my show and tell. You got really good, and the, the white clover is trying to stretch out I really out didn't to have this. to go very far to get no. this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sure you did. There's, there's I could have brought lots a lot in. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting though, that because it's a nitrogen fixer, the grass is around it do actually look better right until they're squelched. Yep. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much, mm -hmm. Tom. And let's move to you next, Rusty Malding. Hi, my name is Rusty Malding. Um, I am a, a business partner at Nature's View, along with my wife, Corey, in Watsika, Illinois. Um, I have a show and tell today as well. And it is, uh, hopefully it saves you a little effort and saves your tree at the same time. So I, I consider this to be a dangerous time of year, typically. <laughs> Uh, you look out your front door and you see this beautiful tree in the lawn and you look at it and you think, gosh, that, sh that should look prettier. So you go out and you buy some blocks and you put around your tree. So um, the first slide you're looking at is what happens after you put these blocks and some soil around your tree. It's called flagging. Um, the very center of that tree is sort of dying out. Uh, the branches, entire branches are actually dying. Um, and the second slide you'll notice uh, what the base of it looks like after we, we removed the first layer of, of uh, these blocks. You can kind of see a few roots that are coming out there right towards the edge and a lot of soil that's stacked up on the trunk of the, uh, of the tree. And this, is a, this is a red maple. Um, the next slide will show what happens when we reveal what's underneath all that soil. Basically, you have girdling roots. Um, when you uh, put soil on top 
of the root, root zone. Uh, these roots from maples will just go crazy and start circling around and growing around. And essentially, it's like putting a rubber band around your arm. It, it eventually, it, it's going to, you know, your arm's going to fall off. <laughs> uh, it does the same thing to your tree. Uh, it, it's cutting off the supply of water and nutrients between the leaves and the roots. Uh, this is an example of a, a new installed tree. Uh, it's a simple mulch ring. It has a generous distance between the root or the, the trunk and the turf. It's easy to mow around. It protects the tree. It, it does a lot of really great things. It regulates moisture and temperature. This is the best setting for uh, a new tree. Uh, and then, so that's a simple tree ring. Um, it may not be as pretty as you'd like. If you start thinking outside of the ring, um, that last slide showed a nice big old oak um, with, uh, it had some climbing hydrangea on it, some hosta, uh, there's some ferns in there, uh, and it was definitely not in a circle, but it was part of the bed that was up close to the house. And mm -hmm. this is, I call it thinking outside of the ring as opposed to outside of the box. Ooh, very yeah. good. <laughs> wow, that poor tree. Because you do see the roots without any boxing in, and wow, once you put those blocks up, oh, that was sad. So anyway, I don't want a rubber band on my arm. No, no rubber bands on your arm. That's no, what I've learned from deal. this. Oh, I mean, <laughs> don't ring around. Um, don't ring around the rosy. Keep keep the soil off of the trunk. Okay. It, it's uh, girdling roots are a problem, and it also it's just it didn't evolve to be that way. It's Very a, good. Thank you for those uh, visuals. That's great. All right, let's go next to you, Ms. Jennifer Fishburn. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jennifer Fishburne. I work for the University of Illinois Extension. I cover, I'm a horticulture educator covering Logan, Menard, and Sagamon counties. Um, I like to talk about um, herbs and vegetables, which are really looking wonderful right now with all this rain. Um, and carrying on this evening with the red maple um, <laughs> theme, um, I have a, a branch from a red maple that has um, potato leaf hopper damage and I'm not sure if folks can see it, but what it does is it makes the leaves cup under. Um, as you can see here, they, they cup. Um, and not only that, um, the toxins from the potato leaf hopper can cause the browning that you see here on the tips of the leaves. So if you see that, that could be an indication of potato leaf hopper. And in addition to that, you may also see the red streaking in the leaves um, as you do on this one right here. Um, Interestingly though, you'll rarely probably see the insect, um, but you can always see the damage that it causes. So that's And you just my... wait it out? You just wait it out. Um, generally it's one of those things that's not going to, you know, take over the entire tree and cause extreme damage. It just um, damages a few leaves, which they can still photosynthesize for the most part, mm -hmm. so um, usually okay. And this year they'll probably grow out of it. Yeah, with all the with moisture. All the moisture. <laughs> That's true. Well, thank you very much for that. Well, we do want to go to a special Did You Know next. The entire squash plant is edible. The leaves, tendrils, shoots, stems, flowers, seeds, and fruit can all be eaten. Also, Presidents Washington and Jefferson both grew squashes in their gardens. Isn't that exciting? Okay, well, gardeners think it's exciting, and so it is exciting. <laughs> All right, let's go to <laughs> line one, and uh, Mary's got a question about cone flowers. Hi, Mary. Hi, um, I have uh, a lot of, of the different varieties of cone flowers, and this year on the stem of the cone flower up by the flower, there's uh, some white cobwebbing. Um, it looks, and then there's some little, uh, when I touch it, some little white bugs. And I wondered what I would use to get rid of that. And then I've also noticed that for some reason, some of my cone flowers just start wilting and then they die. And I wondered if that was due with this or if it, that was uh, maybe a fungus or something that was causing that. Okay, so we're all looking at each other. Who would like to um, attack the coneflower question? <laughs> I'm wondering, <laughs> could the dying be um, water related? I, 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 that would be my first thought. If uh, depending mm -hmm. on our soil conditions, um, if it's holding way too much water, that could that could be a pro uh, an indicator of why it might be wilting. Um, the insects, though. 
Mm, not really sure. They typically don't have a lot I'm of not, problems. I've not seen um, anything on mine this year, but um, or any year usually, but we don't have our entomologist here with us, but um, offhand I can't think of anything webbing unless it is a good year for any, spiders. Any on it ever? Um, I don't it's recall not, seeing mildew not really. on it. Yeah. Because it's got such a bristly right. leaf that it um, it doesn't seem to have that. So we're not too sure about the the actual insect. What I would probably suggest to do if um, she's not certain is go ahead and if it's just on the tip ends, maybe go ahead and cut those tips off for now. They'll they'll read they'll leaf back out and and still bloom, but um, that might be helpful just to get rid of those tips where the damage is actually showing. And not that you need to add any more water, but a good spray of water would probably get rid of some of the insects. Yeah. But with the water logging, I mean, there is a lot of water logging this year, so you may or may not want to do that, but uh, you could just do a physical method of getting rid of those. Okay, well, thank you very much for your question. And we're gonna uh, move on to Peggy's question about uh, vines, and it's on line three. Hi there, Peggy. Hi. Uh, well, my question is this. I have uh, some uh, mature trees on my property, and the, the lower limbs have been trimmed, so the trunk is quite long and, and uh, you know, naked, I guess you'd say. And uh, also, I, I tend to get a lot of vines growing, uh, Virginia creepers especially, and uh, also what I call winter creeper. I don't know what the official name of it is. But they, uh, I, I want to know if, if it damages a tree or, or if there's any downside at all to having uh, creepers growing up the trunk of it. Okay. Or should I cut those off and, and be you know, careful to keep them off of my trees. Um, Virginia creeper is a twining vine, and so it's probably kind of wrapping itself around. Um, it would need some way to kind of grab a hold and get up, and if you've got it limbed up that far, um, I'd be surprised if it's getting up into your actual canopy. Um, but there are some vines, like um, uh, uh, climbing hydrangea, which will s adhere to the trunk and then, you know, climb their way on up the tree. Uh, typically speaking, there's a reasonable relationship between the two, and the, the vines don't necessarily choke off uh, the tree and cause significant damage. Um, unless it's wrapping itself around and, and doing much like the roots that I was just talking about and sort of girdle it, uh, that would be the only concern, but you'd need a very large vine after a long period of time for that to happen. Um, I, I've, usually that's not an issue. I've seen vines actually trained to go up trees, and it's very attractive. Mm -hmm. So I've seen English yeah. ivy. Grapes out in the woods. Yes, grapes right. in the woods, and they don't cause. They don't. So, yeah. so I think as long as you like the way the vine looks. Yeah, and, and the Virginia creeper has a great fall color. It does. Uh, which, is kind of, which is kind of a nice added bonus, uh, depending on what tree you have, that may be an added uh, an aesthetic value. <laughs> the only vine I don't like climbing up is one that has uh, ivy and poison, poison in, the, yes. and they have a nice fall color and, and, and too. And they can c climb trees as well. Yeah. Oh, so they do. Absolutely. So yeah, so, so don't let poison ivy, but every, the Virginia creeper and should be really pretty. Okay, thank you, Peggy, for that question, and let's move along to Cindy's question about lilacs on line five. Hi, Cindy. Hi, how are you tonight? Doing great, how are you? Okay, uh, I was trimming my Miss Kim mm -hmm. lilac bushes and I didn't get one completely finished. Is, am I too late to finish it? Uh, we're actually still trimming uh, Miss Kim lilacs right now. Um, generally, the rule of thumb is if you have a spring flowering plant, we try to stop by the end of July. I've pushed that sometimes, and you can go into mid to even late August. You, you stand a, a potential chance of reducing your floral display a little bit, um, but uh, you're still fine to trim Miss Kim lilacs or viburnums, forsythia, all those kinds of plants uh, well up through the end of July even. Um, usually right about now is a great time though to, to give it the first haircut and so it kind of grows back and it has a little bit more of a natural shape to it and the flower display looks all that much better, I feel, uh, the next spring. I was trimming lilacs today. Were That's you? very interesting, <laughs> your timing of your question, Cindy, but I trimmed, I like to deadhead them. Mm -hmm. Always like to deadhead them, do a little pruning. And I, one, I took one third of the bigger branches out, just one, but it needed it. 
So go for it. I think that's a good idea. All right. Well, we're going to, I'm not sure if we have any um, phone lines available. Let's see. Let's go to Marilyn's question about dogwoods on line one. Hi, Marilyn. Hi, Diane. And uh, I, I have a question. I will hope you can solve a mystery about my two dogwood trees. They're side by side. They're both the same kind, and they're, they're white. They bloomed pr profusely this spring. And now, as I look at them side by side, one of them has the leaves curled up toward the center of the, of the stem, and it's losing its color. It almost looks like it's been whitewashed or something. The other one next to it is in great shape, and it looks beautiful and green and like it should. What's going on? Can you help? We occasionally get this question. It's side by side. The two are not the same. One mm -hmm. is different than the other. Mm -hmm. My go-to answer is usually something about the soil, even though they're side by side. But I don't know if there's more clay. It's happened in my own garden. Soil, or, or depending on how old it is, it could be, it could be something that um, when it was planted, mm -hmm. um, one could have had girdling roots, the other might not have. Um, sometimes that happens, particularly if you buy them in containers. So that, that's a possibility as well. Yeah, there, there, no two plants are exactly alike. Um, I've, yeah, I see that too. And there mm -hmm. is sometimes no rhyme or reason, but it's just like you know, two people that are, go and have the same experiences and one gets sick one day and the other one doesn't. It, it just kind of depends. Yeah. It, there are some environmental stresses um, that uh, an insect or one may have a little bit of uh, animal rodent damage, uh, rabbits, something mm -hmm. along those lines that could have caused it to put it be under stress. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that's why I like to plant a variety of things and not all <laughs> the same thing in one place because, oh, it's heartbreaking. So, uh, Marilyn, we gave you a few suggestions, but sometimes it's really hard to tell uh, what is causing it. So at least we're letting you know it's happened before you're not the only one. Well, let's go back to our panelists next and we'll do some either show and tells or what have you got for us, Tom? We'll start with you. Well, uh, given the uh, the current uh, weather uh, trends with all the rainfall we've been receiving, I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, turf uh, with a l excessive water or flooded, uh, flooded turf and some things uh, that people might want to be aware of. Um, obviously now the turf is, is growing well, it's lush. It's also, we, uh, we have a lot of weeds uh, as a result of that. I, I mentioned white clover earlier. <coughs> Excuse me, I've seen a lot more buckhorn planting uh, than mm -hmm. normal. And again, I think the weeds that I'm seeing are oftentimes related to low nitrogen conditions. So, so again, with all this rainfall, we have, we have leaching, we have excessive, or we have a, a lot of uh, abundant uh, growth and it's using the nitrogen. Uh, we have denitrification occurring where, where, the, uh, where the nitrogen uh, be can become unavailable to the turf plants. And so there's a lot of uh, uh, activities with the floods related to, the, uh, to uh, nitrogen use. Um, uh, one of the big concerns I have is, uh, is right uh, during the, the spring and early summers when the turf, uh, the, our cool season turf grasses like Kentucky bluegrass, perennial ryegrass, the fescues, uh, grow most actively and they put on the most roots that they do during the course of a, a year uh, in this uh, uh, spring and early summer growing period. And uh, we're not going to get the root growth we normally mm -hmm. get because the root zone is going to be flooded. It's, mm -hmm. There's not going to be oxygen uh, in that root zone, and so the turf is not going to put on a lot of roots. It doesn't need to right now. It looks great. It's yeah. doing, doing well. Should we get into a hot, dry condition or a, a period later in the summer, we, we might see some, uh, some problems with the turf uh, because there isn't going to be enough root system to support uh, uh, good health uh, and, uh, and, uh, and good quality can, uh, growth uh, during, uh, during that period. So we do need to be careful uh, and watch the turf. And if we do get into a dry period, uh, uh, it may lead to wanting, uh, wanting to irrigate, uh, maybe when you wouldn't normally irrigate, but to keep your turf health going and to, and to uh, take the place of some of the, the, the inadequate root systems, uh, some uh, applied irrigation would be uh, useful. Okay, wow. 
I don't recall talking about this topic this late in the, mm -hmm. in the <laughs> summer before. We, we had this, uh, two, I think 2010, 2011, we had pretty, some similar, not maybe not to this degree, but we had some not conditions. Not this late, I think. When maybe. we started getting drought in July and the turf really mm -hmm. took a hit then uh, in right. the latter part of the growing season. But it seems more moist than usual. Yes, it does. <laughs> okay, well thank you, Tom, and now Rusty. Sure. Thanks, Diane. Um, we have a, um, an email from uh, Evelyn in, Sh in the Chicagoland area uh, concerning Siberian squill in her lawn. And um, Siberian squill is a beautiful little bulb, um, blue flowers in the spring, very early, and um, it can get rather aggressive um, at <laughs> once it's planted and, and it's in a happy place. <laughs> and, and so sometimes maybe you bought a house or maybe uh, you've moved into a neighborhood where you've, you've inherited this or maybe perhaps you had a couple in an ornamental bed and they've, they've escaped. Uh, in, either in, in either case, um, what do you do? Um, actually, Tom and I were speaking about this a little bit beforehand. And um, there, so essentially there's a, there's a little tiny bulb. Um, it's, it's really small, it's, about, it's less than this, the size of the end of your finger. And uh, these are all over and you have to either kill it or remove it. Um, there are some things that you can do sort of culturally if you're uh, sort of averse to chemicals. Um, year after year, the, best, the, the easiest way to put it under stress is to just remove the foliage as soon as it comes up. And that's going to deprive it of the ability to produce energy and store it in the roots uh, or the bulb. Um, that's going to take, that's sort of the long approach. Uh, the shorter approach is to try to find a, an herbicide that would work to kill it. Um, because it's early season, you want to probably go with a, a 2,4-D ester formulation. Um, we talked about potentially a Roundup or a glyphosate product. Um, there's some discussion as to whether or not that would, that would work well. What I'd probably suggest is talk to your local um, uh, turf expert, uh, your local lawn care applicator, and see if they've had some experience with getting rid of it. I have not with this particular one. There are some other bulbs that I know that the 2,4-D the ester has worked on. I've read some things that suggest that it might not work real well. So it is, mm -hmm. it is tricky. It's hard to get rid of. Yeah, we use, uh, as we, we talked about, we use 2,4-D, for example, on Star of Beth Bethlehem. Uh, right. And that's a common, maybe a little more in the southern part of this, uh, the region than, uh, than, uh, than the, the central or northern part of the area. And Star of Bethlehem is, seems much more invasive to me than oh, Siberian yes. squill. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's interesting. There, there there are a lot of people though that uh, it, you either love it or you hate it. <laughs> yeah. If it could just be in ground cover, it really does a great job. But in the lawn, I've seen it where the lawn is no more. Yeah. So yeah. okay, thank you for that. And now Jennifer. Well, mine's a fairly easy one, I think. Um, Hazel wants to know um, when should she divide her hostas? The best time probably to divide your hostas is going to be in the spring, um, April or so, when they first start to leaf out. Uh, fall, or excuse me, doing it in late August, uh, mid-August, depending on where you're located, may also be another great option. Um, but if it's something where it's bothering you right now, given the conditions that we have with all the moisture, I think it would perf be perfectly fine to do so. You're just going to have to keep in mind that when it gets hot out, you're going to have to water more often. Um, but dividing them, most people will just dig up the entire clump and then um, split them off and then put a small portion back into the original hole and move the others and hosta. Once you plant a few hosta, you can pretty much in about three or four years fill, fill, fill a good size yard with them because they, <laughs> they, they, when they're happy, they will um, grow pretty well. And then don't divide them anymore. Yeah, right. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for that. Let's go to a tomato question. Uh, Linda has one for us online too. Hi, Linda. Hi, Diane. This is uh, Michelle's mother. Oh, hi. Um, I have a, a tomato question. Yes. Uh, about six weeks ago, I, I bought a uh, tomato plant that was big and blooming, and it was in about a, like a foot pot, and I set it on my back porch, and I've been watering it vigorously every evening, and um, I've noticed it's just blooming vigorously, but my question is, when there's a cluster of like five or six blooms, why does it only put on one tomato and the rest just kind of shrivel up and die? And uh, I wonder what I'm doing wrong or, or uh, what I should be doing to correct this problem. 
Uh, We're looking at Jennifer. Yeah, there's nothing you can do to correct the problem. What the plant is doing is adjusting for itself. Um, the plant can only support so much, so many fruits, and if you have it in a container, it's going to be less than in the ground. So what the plant is doing is, is aborting those flowers so it won't get fruit. So um, it's actually probably better in the long run because you'll get bigger fruit that way, where if it, where if it actually let all those flowers get fruit, they'd be, they'd be much smaller, particularly in a container situation. Um, there's other reasons for flower drop as well, but that would probably be the most likely in this case. And in a container. Yes, in likely. a container. So in this case, you're doing nothing wrong. That's really good to hear. <laughs> <laughs> in a container, it can only do so much. So, because uh, sometimes later it gets to be heat, but I think probably early on it's not. So this is great. We've had a, a variety of questions and we are so thankful that um, we have such a good panel that they can handle all this variety of questions. We want to thank uh, all three of you for being here and for all the variety and your show and tells. I think that really helps when you see that many show and tells. Um, also, we have a crew that's here every week and I want to thank them. And so you know that there's lots going on behind the scenes as well. Well, we hope that you get out and have a great week gardening. Enjoy outdoors and learn a lot. And we'll see you next week. Goodbye. <music>